Hello, my name is Lucia and I am a geologist with the Nevada Division of Minerals. Welcome to this video in which we will discuss rock collecting, mining claims, land status, and land research. This presentation will cover a fair amount of material, but it is meant to be a general overview with links to more detailed information if one would like to pursue it. So let's begin. I would like to take a moment to briefly introduce our open data site, which we will be utilizing later. This is the homepage of our open data site equipped with our mission statement and disclaimer. The URL and QR code for our open data site can be found at the top of the screen. Scrolling down, we come to several icons which represent links to our various pages. There is lots of information on this site, so much that it has a presentation of its own equipped with a demonstration on how to work the interactive maps. This presentation can be found at the link which is being pointed out by the red arrow or by scanning the QR code shown on the screen. For our purposes, this presentation will mostly focus on the active mining claims of Nevada page. We will briefly visit the education and outreach page in a moment. Scrolling down farther, you will come to the bottom of the home page, which has links to other sources of information regarding geology, exploration, and mining in Nevada. Now we will scroll back up to the pages available within the open data site. And as promised, we will briefly visit the education and outreach page. And here is our education and outreach page. We can see a map which shows all of the active mines and energy producers in Nevada. Most maps on our website are interactive and if the user clicks on a point, a pop-up will render yielding information about the feature. In this case, the pop-up is giving information on the active mine we clicked on. Scrolling down, We come to a listing of educational videos the employees at Indom have made to assist in distance learning. There are summaries for all videos along with links to classroom activities and more. We have several videos covering various topics. We can see here we have videos covering geologic history, evolution, and the geologic history of Nevada, the basics of mineral identification, the rock cycle, mining in Nevada, the geologic history and ore deposits of Nevada, on a brownie, ore deposits, cupcake core drilling, and more. There are several resources on this page and we feel it is worth a visit. Okay, let's move on to the topic at hand. So what exactly can you collect? Well, you can collect gemstones, common rock varieties, invertebrate fossils, and petrified wood for private or personal usage if they are not utilized for commercial purposes, used for trade, or bartered. Let's define personal use. Personal use means personal, non-commercial use by an individual user. Personal use excludes use for the benefit of any third party, including commercial, educational, governmental, or non-profit entities. Non-commercial use. Non-commercial means something is not primarily intended for or directed towards commercial advantage or monetary compensation by an individual or organization. What you can't collect consists of any saleable minerals such as sand, gravel, cinders, topsoil, and other common varieties of minerals. You cannot collect vertebrate fossils, uncommon invertebrate fossils, or cave resources, including plant, animal, and geologic features. According to the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 8365.1-5, except on developed recreation sites and areas, or where otherwise prohibited and posted, it is permissible to collect from public lands reasonable amounts of the following for non-commercial purposes. 
non-renewable resources such as rock and mineral specimens, common invertebrates and common plant fossils, and semi-precious gemstones. And as previously discussed, you may collect a certain amount of petrified wood. So what this means, you can collect reasonable amounts of gemstones, common rock varieties, invertebrate fossils, common plant fossils, and petrified wood for private or personal usage on all federally managed lands unless collecting is otherwise prohibited and posted. If you can't go on to Department of Energy or Department of Defense lands, it should be posted, no trespassing, within the boundaries of ACECs or areas of critical environmental concern you may or may not be able to collect. For example, if a site has been set aside to preserve a certain suite of fossils, you will not be able to collect there. But say the site was set aside for the protection of a species of lizard, well, you can probably still collect a reasonable amount of specimens there. If you can't, it should be posted otherwise. Within the boundary of most U.S. fish and wildlife lands, you are not permitted to collect. There are exceptions, but if you really needed to go rock collecting on their land, I would contact them. And on that note, if you really needed to go collect on any public lands, but you are not quite sure if you can, I would reach out to the administrative agency and ask the question. Better to be once safe than twice sorry. You cannot collect on private or state lands without the permission of the landowner or claimant. You cannot collect within the boundary of an active mining claim without the claimant's permission. You cannot collect in developed recreation sites and areas or within the boundary of areas that are clearly posted no trespassing. You cannot collect on Indian reservation lands or Bureau of Indian Affairs land without permission from tribal authorities. You also cannot collect within the boundaries of national monuments, national historic sites, or national wildlife refuges. Again, if in doubt, call the Surface Management Agency or landowner. Seek the advice from someone who looks at this stuff frequently. Or, if it is really complicated, either seek out a landman or just don't collect there. Just a quick reminder, it is never safe to go into an abandoned mine. No matter how many precautions are taken, the dangers associated with abandoned mines such as bad air, dangerous gases, mine collapse, rotten timbers, becoming lost and disoriented, explosives, chemicals, and the lack of a guaranteed rescue can lead to a deadly situation in only a matter of minutes. There is nothing inside abandoned mines that is worth as much as your life. Stay out, stay alive. I know it would seem like now would be a great time to answer the question, well, how do I figure land status out? We will answer that question, but there may be some people listening who might be interested in staking some mining claims. And in order to do so, you also have to figure out which lands you can stake claims on. For both mineral collecting and claim staking, we are answering similar land status questions. So we will answer both questions together in a moment. But first, let's talk about the different kinds of minerals. To understand where these came from, let's take a little trip back in time. The 1872 mining law was put into place to promote the development of the mining resources of the United States. The land's mineral riches would be made available to every citizen and the efforts of each would be protected only to the extent that a discovery was made, pursued, and even then within limits designed to prevent monopolization of large deposits. Under the 1872 General Mining Law, the law that still oversees mining claims and mining today, a United States citizen could go out 
stake a claim and would have the exclusive right to use and possess the property for mining purposes and to develop and sell the mining products from the same free of any royalty to the federal government. And up until 1990, after discovery and at least $500 worth of labor improvements had been made upon the claim, the claimant could purchase the land for $5 per acre for load claims and $2.50 per acre for a placer claim. We will talk about these different mining claim types in a minute. Mining claims over oil-rich lands were being staked so quickly during the oil rush of 1909 that they were becoming unavailable for extraction of oil for military purposes. This led to the Minerals Leasing Act of 1920. In a nutshell, the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 allowed the federal government to keep control and possession of these lands. It enabled drilling and extraction of these minerals with authority granted by the federal government. It enabled the government to manage the exploration of leasable minerals, and it enabled the government to receive compensation from the lessee for the privilege of extracting minerals on public lands. Leasable minerals include oil, gas, oil shale, coal, geothermal resources, potash, sodium, native asphalt, semi-solid bitumen, bituminous rock, phosphate, chlorides, sulfates, certain carbonates, borates, silicates or nitrates of potassium or sodium, and related products and sulfur. It was later found in a study that the intent of the mining law was being taken advantage of. People were staking claims over tracts of land on which the discovery was sand gravel, or even clay, also known as the common mineral varieties. There aren't a whole lot of parcels that I can think of that don't have at least a little sand or clay. Using sand or clay as the discovery, which is required, they would ante up their $500 worth of labor improvements and purchase the land, land that was located along beautiful stretches of river or in valuable stands of timber for $2.50 to $5 per acre. To stop this abuse of the law, the 1947 Minerals Act, later modified in 1955, established that certain minerals on federal lands can only be disposed of through a contract of sale or a free use permit. This group of minerals, the saleable minerals, includes petrified wood, common varieties of sand, stone, gravel, pumicite, cinders, and clay. So that leaves us with the locatables, or hard rock minerals, for which a mineral claim can be staked. These include metallic and non-metallic minerals, special varieties of limestone and gypsum, tantalum, heavy minerals in placer form, gemstones, and other uncommon varieties of rocks and minerals. There are two main groups of claims, unpatented and patented. Unpatented mining claims are claims located on land owned by the federal government. The owner of a valid mining claim or mill site has the exclusive right to use and possess the property for mining purposes and to develop and sell the mining products from the same free of any royalty to the federal government as long as the land was open to location, the location is properly made, a discovery of a valuable mineral deposit is made, the claim is properly maintained through annual filings and or payments. A patented mining claim is an unpatented mining claim that has met the requirements to be patented and purchased from the federal government, resulting in the conversion from federal to private ownership. There has been a moratorium on the patenting of mining claims since 1990. The types of claims you would stake would be unpatented mining claims. 
So the first choice you need to make is which type of unpatented mining claim do you need to stake? You must choose between a load claim or a placer claim. A load claim is located on lands where the minerals are contained in veins or loads of quartz or other rock in place. In general, it means that the deposit being located using a load claim must be a mineralized zone held in place by adjoining rock. A placer claim is located on all forms of deposits, excepting veins of quartz or other rock in place, or any deposit that does not qualify as a load. There are also mill site and tunnel claims. A mill site claim is used for activities related to mining or the processing of materials and may only be placed on lands that are non-mineral in character. Tunnel sites aren't utilized much. They were used for driving tunnels for exploration of load deposits. So, what do you need to do to stake a claim? Well, after you know that the land is open, first erect a location monument at the proper location for the type of claim you intend to stake. Post the notice of location upon the location monument, which will include the claim name, the name of the locator, the locator's mailing address, the date of location, this is very important because it starts the clock, and the area claimed, which is different for load and placer claims. Please refer to the text on the screen. Then, within 60 days of the notice of location posting, the boundaries of the claim must be defined by placing a valid legal monument at each corner of the claim unless it is a placer claim located on surveyed land. Then the claim may be taken by legal subdivision and corner monuments are not required. Within 90 days of posting the notice of location, you must file the certificates of location and claim maps with the BLM and the county recorder in the county which the claim is located in, along with all fees required by both. Load claims can be oriented in any direction and are 1,500 feet long and 300 feet wide on either side of the location monument for a total claim width of 600 feet. Placer claims are 20 acres each and in general follow the Public Land Survey System or Township Range and Section designations which will briefly be discussed here shortly. Be sure your discovery monument is not within the boundary of a pre-existing senior or older claim. This will void your claim. Also, if you stake a claim over another person's claim which precedes your location, the only part of the claim you stake that is valid will be that which is outside of the preceding claim boundary. So if we look at the diagram on the screen, there are senior or older claims named one through six in the upper right hand side of the screen and younger claims named A through E starting in the lower left hand side of the screen. If we look at claim A, we can see that the location monument, which is signified by the LM, is located inside of the older number two claim. Therefore, claim A is void. Again, your location monument cannot be inside the boundary of an older claim. If we look at claim B and C, we can see the location monuments are not within the older claims, so they are valid, but the portion of claims B and C that overlap claims 1 and 2 are not valid. Only the shaded portions of claims B and C would be valid. But even though the shaded portion of claim C is valid, the portion of claim C which includes the discovery overlaps the older claim 1. Therefore, the discovery for this claim is not valid. Legal monuments. 
I am not going to read dimensions here, but legal monuments include blazings or markings on trees, rock cairns, a stone that is not in place, a metal post, or a wooden post. If you can't sink a post in the ground because the ground is too hard, you may place the stake in a mound of earth or stones. If proper placement of a monument is impractical or dangerous to life or limb, the monument can be placed at the nearest safe spot and be properly marked to designate the place where it should be. Plastic and PVC posts are not valid monuments as they cause significant bird, reptile, and insect deaths. It is never permitted to tamper with claim monuments unless you see one of these plastic or PVC posts. If you see one standing, you may remove it out of the ground and lay it down. Maps and certificates of location must be turned into the BLM and county within 90 days of posting the notice of location. If you do not do this, your claim is as if it never existed. The documents that are due, formats, scales, and other information are shown on this screen. I will not spend much time here other than to show you that it is here for your future reference. Here is an example of a certificate of location and a claim map. Again, I am not going to stay here for long, but I wanted you to know that it is here for future reference. The next two diagrams are to help individuals visualize when forms are due and to whom they are due to. Why two diagrams, you ask? Well, you can hold claims by paying annual maintenance fees or by obtaining a small miners fee waiver. Paperwork due for holding claims under these two methods are different, so for clarity purposes they will be presented separately. We will discuss what a small miners fee waiver is in a moment. If utilizing the maintenance fee method, this would be the workflow. The top shows what would be due to the BLM and the bottom shows what would be due to the county along with the deadlines. An assessment year for a claim is from September 1st of one year to September 1st of the following year. So here on September 1st of 2021, we were discussing mining claims on the first day of assessment year 2022. Why September 1st you ask? Well, this is because the fiscal year for the BLM ends on September 30th. This gives them time to have an accurate accounting of claims so they can close out the year. So, if we staked a claim and posted our notice of location on September 20th of 2020, we would have to have our corner staked by November 19th of 2020 and our certificate of location and claim maps along with all fees filed with the BLM and the county by December 19th of 2020. We would need to have our maintenance fees for assessment year 2022 received by the BLM or postmarked on or before September 1st of 2021. If you missed the boat, your claim is done, void closed. As for the county, you will need to file an affidavit and notice of intent to hold the mining claims for assessment year 2021. Yes, this is backward looking and a little confusing, but that's the way it is. The regs and the statutes specifically state that the notice of intent to hold or proof of labor must be filed with the BLM on or before September 30th of the calendar year in which the assessment year ends. This backward looking feature will make sense in a moment. The next deadline is 
only if you have a mill or tunnel site and consists of documents required by FLTMA or the Federal Land Policy and Management Act of 1976. Again, it is a notice of intent to hold just like the county, which is backwards looking and is due to the BLM on or before December 30th of each year. All right, on to small miners. In order to qualify for a small miners fee waiver for the maintenance fee requirements, the claimant and all related parties shall hold no more than 10 mining claims, mill sites, and tunnel sites in the United States on the date payment is due. Claims held by husband and wife or their underage children, either jointly or individually, are aggregately counted towards the 10 total sites. The same holds true to co-ownership by and association of locators, a corporation, or a partnership. Again, the top half of the diagram shows what would be due to the BLM and the bottom shows what would be due to the county. So, if we staked and posted our notice of location on September 20th of 2020, we would have to have our corner staked by November 19th of 2020 and our certificate of location and claim maps along with all fees filed with the BLM and the county by December 19th of 2020. We would file a small miners waiver for assessment year 2022, which would need to be received by the BLM or postmarked on or before September 1st of 2021. If you miss the boat, your claim is done. You will do this every year you wish to file for a small miners fee waiver. The next due date would be November 1st of 2021, and this would be for the county, where you will need to file an affidavit and notice of intent to hold the mining claims for assessment year 2021. Again, this is backwards looking. For every year after the first year, when you file for a small miners fee waiver, you will file an affidavit of annual assessment work, also known as a proof of labor, which is also backwards looking. Now, this backwards looking thing makes sense because you are stating the work you did for the previous year. Never, never, never file a proof of labor when a notice of intent to hold is due or vice versa. And never, never, never file both as your claim will be forfeited. Now that you are a small miner, you also have the FLIPMO requirement to fulfill every year. These papers are due to the BLM on or before December 30th of every calendar year in which the assessment year ends. So again, for the first year, you would file the notice of intent to hold and every year after, if you are filing for a small miners fee waiver, you will also file with the BLM the Affidavit of Annual Assessment Work. All forms that need to be filed can be found on our website. You can simply type in minerals.nb.gov, select programs, select mining, select claims, and the forms will be listed there. You do not need to use all of these forms. However, these have been reviewed by lawyers and the county recorders, and they meet all informational and formatting requirements. For more information on staking mining claims, it is highly suggested that you review the material provided on our website, including the BLM mining claims presentations, mining claim filing requirements in Nevada, and Special Publication 006 on Mining Claim Procedures for Nevada Prospectors and Miners. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's run through a quick example of land research. Land research is not always easy. If it were, everybody would do it. 
If you really need somebody to dig into a land issue, it is highly suggested that you contact a landman. We will need two things to begin. The first thing would be a map with the Public Land Survey System, which is often referred to as PLSS. For this example, we will be using the Nevada Division of Minerals open data site, specifically the Mining Claims page. This was the page we pointed out in the beginning of this presentation. It is free for the public to use, and almost everything has been formatted to be user-friendly. The Mining Claims page can be found by typing in the URL or by scanning the QR code, both which are shown on this screen. The second thing we will need is the location of the area we are interested in. For review, in the interactive web map, if you zoom into the area you are interested in, the township range and section will appear. Townships are divided into 36 sections, each being one square mile. The numbering starts in the top right hand or northeast corner of the township, then increases to the left and down in an S formation. Sections are always numbered in this order. This never changes. In the left-hand portion of the township shown in the screen, there is a green box with a 7 in the middle. This box is surrounding Township 9 South, Range 5 East, Section 7. Township range and section designations are often abbreviated when written. So in this example, the abbreviated version would be T9S space R5E space S7. Each section is broken down into quarter-quarter sections, which are 160 acres each. So each section has a northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest quarter section. Quarter sections are also broken down into quarter-quarter sections in a similar fashion. To begin land research, we must first navigate to the area of interest in the web map. You can do this in one of two ways. You can either manually navigate to the area using your mouse, or if you know it, you can enter the PLSS description into the search bar in the top left-hand corner of the map. From the drop-down in the search bar, select Township, Range, and Section. Enter the PLSS description in the proper format. In this map, we are using the BLM's format. So, Township 18 North, Range 35 East, Section 1 would be typed out like this. 0 180N 0350E001 and press enter and the map will automatically pan to your location. Next, we need to verify the land status. First, we will simplify the view by turning some layers off. To turn layers on and off, simply click on the stack of papers icon that is outlined in red and clear the check mark from the box next to layers we don't need. Right now, I only want to view land status, so I will clear the check marks next to the claims and major mines layers to clean things up a bit. The red star is the location we are interested in. I have clicked on the legend icon to view the symbology for this map. We would prefer to collect in areas where there aren't any mining claims and we must stay on BLM or U.S. Forest Service land. Our star plots on private ground, so we must either collect somewhere else or get permission from the landowner. Since the location we are interested in is on private ground, you cannot stake a claim here unless the surface rights are separate from the mineral rights, which in Nevada doesn't happen all that often. Research for mineral rights will not be covered in this presentation. 
I would like to call your attention to the layers which show lands withdrawn from mineral entry or with limitations. If you are looking in an area that this layer covers, further research is warranted. Please refer to the land research how-to document, which is a deeper dive into land research, including mineral rights. This document can be found under the interactive map located on the mining claims page or by scanning the QR code shown on this screen. But what if we really wanted to collect at this location? Well, we would need to ask the landowner. How do we know who that is? Well, that information lives at the county assessor's office. When you click on a point on the map, every layer that is there will be selected and the pop-up for each will be generated. So, if we click on the map, we can use the arrows in the top right hand corner of the pop-up that appears to navigate through the different pop-ups. When we do so, we will come to one pop-up that is specific to the county. The pop-up for the county is consists of links to the real property search, the county recorder's office, PDF parcel maps, and an interactive map for the county. If an interactive map exists for a county, use it. It makes things much easier. So we will click on the link for the county's interactive map. Which will take you to their interactive map. Use the layers button at the bottom of the screen to generate the layers list so you can turn on the BLM's PLSS layer and navigate to the area we are interested in. Once we have reached our destination, we can click on the section of interest and scroll down through the pop-up until we come to the assessor's data link. Click on it. The link will bring us to this page. And if we scroll down, we come to a section where the owner information is listed along with an address. From here, if the owner is a company, you may be able to Google search the company and get a phone number to call to request permission to collect or, as you can see, there is an address to which a letter requesting permission could be sent. Okay, so maybe the rock you are looking to collect is a little bit more widespread. It would be awesome if it were in section 28, because if we turn the claim point listings and claims per sections back on, we can see that there are no claims in section 28, and it is all BLM land. It's perfect. If you wanted to stake a claim in section 28, it appears that you can do that as well. There are a couple more maps you could check to be sure that this ground is open, but we can save that for some other time. You're probably safe. If one were to stake a claim and there were to be some big problem as far as land status goes, the BLM is probably going to let you know. But let's say you see some good looking rocks on the very east side of section 30. The blue dot in the middle indicates that there are claims in this section. The section is colored a darker shade of yellow, which indicates, according to the legend, that there is somewhere between 11 and 30 claims in this section. If we click on the section, This pop-up would appear, which tells us how many claim listings there are in this section. It takes 32 claims to fill a section. This section has 18, so there is hope for some open ground. Let's investigate using the most current data from the BLM's MLRS database. So, all the query parameters needed to research this along with the instructions are included in the pop-ups. So copy the text outlined in red 
this is the township range and section formatted as the BLM wants it. Then click on the link that is also outlined in red. That will take you to this page. Set the admin state to Nevada and the disposition to active as per the instructions in the pop-up, then paste the PLSS that you copied into the appropriate box and hit OK. This is the report that will be generated. We can see all of the claims in this section are owned by EP Minerals. Every claim has a serial number. A group of claims staked and filed together have a lead file number. If you were to click on the link for the serial number, a report would render showing information on that individual claim. If you were to select the link for the lead file number, a report would render showing information for all of the claims in that group. We will discuss another use of the lead file number here in a moment. We will click on one of the links. And when we do, this report will be generated. On this report, we have the claimant information listed along with an address. Again, from here, if the owner is a company, you may be able to Google search the company and get a number to call to request permission to collect, or we can send a letter to the address listed requesting permission to collect. But maybe you want to see if there is open ground lurking amongst those 18 claim listings in which you could collect or stake a claim. If it is not obvious by looking at the quarter sections the claims listed cover, you will have to obtain the actual claim maps submitted by the claimants to the BLM or the county. When requesting files from the BLM, you will need to provide the lead serial number for every block of claims you are interested in obtaining a map for. For the county, be sure to have the serial numbers and the company name or names on hand as well. Remember, this can be found in the map pop-ups or in the report we generated from MLRS. You can visit the BLM State Office to request and copy the documents or the County Recorder's Office for the county the claims are staked within. In the event of a pandemic, you may have to call for an appointment. You can also view the claim listings information from the map by using the select tool and the attribute table, or by using the pop-up for the claim point listings themselves. Just remember, this will not be the most current data. To use the select tool, click on the select icon outlined in red. Drag your mouse around the features you wish to select. Click on the three dots next to the layer you wish to view the data from. Select Open Attribute Table, or you can export the data as a CSV file to view in Excel. To use the pop-ups, click on the points in the center of the section to generate the pop-up. You can navigate through the pop-ups using the arrows in the top right-hand corner of the pop-up, which will render information on all claim listings for that section. You can view the serial register page report, the one we looked at previously with the claimant's address, using the pop-up as well. Simply copy the serial number outlined in red in the third line of the text, and then click on the link outlined in red further down, which will take you to this page. Paste the serial number into the box provided on the left and select whether you have copied an individual serial number or the lead file number, then hit apply. This method will generate the same report we looked at earlier. Well, 
If you are feeling like this right now, I apologize, but there's a lot that goes into this stuff. It isn't always easy, and it gets way more complicated than this. If you really would like to dive into some further land research, again, I strongly suggest you take a look at a how-to document that was compiled for land research, which can be found underneath the interactive map on the mining claims page or by scanning the QR code shown in the screen. This document is long, but it is a step-by-step -step type of document that goes pretty fast. Remember, if you are unsure of whether you can collect in a particular area, contact the appropriate land management agency. And if the land research gets too complicated, think about hiring a landman. My hope is that I have presented this complicated topic in a manner that is at least a little bit easy to understand. If you have any questions, shoot me an email and I can try to answer them for you. I would like to thank you for tuning in to this presentation and have a great day.